All right, Genesis chapter 4, verse number 18, it says, And unto Enoch was born Irad, and Irad beget Mehuila, and Mehuila beget Methusel, and Methusel beget Lamech. And Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Ada, the name of the other Zillah. And Ada bare Jabal. He was the father of such as dwell in tents, and of such as have cattle. So we see here, here's a man that was like a master of cattle, of understanding a farmer, and, and understanding how to raise cattle and everything else. He, he was a man that was very, these are not men that were learning this technique. These were men that had it mastered. I want you to understand that. There's a difference today. We, in our mindset, what we have is we have this mindset that everybody started out and they all had to learn these things and they were, no, they're not like us. Okay, let me put it this way. I want to try to change your thinking because Satan has twisted your thinking around. Here's what Satan has made all of us think. Satan has made all of us think is that they were cavemen and we're the smart men. And I want to reverse it, and I want to say, no, we're more like the knuckle dragon cavemen, and they were advanced intelligence and advanced beings in an advanced civilization. That's the understanding. Of course, we're not cavemen. We're made in God's image and all that. But the point is, is that we are getting dumber. They are getting smarter. Now, I also have a theory, which I believe lines up with the scriptures, and that is this, that we will not attain to the knowledge that they had. Or the advanced civilization. We have attained to a portion of that and are heading to an even more portion, uh, a greater portion of that when we get into the singularity. When the singularity is met and you get to that point, you're going to merge man with the machine and with the ghost in the machine, which is Satan, and then online, and then you become online where facts and everything with a chip in the forehead or in the right arm is going to make you like a god. Okay? They're already working it. They're already doing it now. It's already happening now. We cannot attain to what they had because of the environment. We're going to talk about that in another, another um, sermon or another, another message where we'll deal with the environment. Because it's important to understand that their environment was way different than ours. And their intelligence was because of their, partly because of their environment. And partly because we're a copy of 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 a lot of copies. Okay? And what were they? The original. Adam was the original. Right? And Adam was a son of God. Right? God made Adam in his likeness after his own image. So Adam was a perfect copy. Adam's understanding intelligence. Remember when I showed you, and we'll talk about that in advanced civilization, but remember when I showed you that, that Adam named all the animals, what the Bible says about Adam named all the, well, how did he know how to do that? Because of the mind God gave him. That's how he was perfect. He had an advanced mind. And these people had an advanced mind. They were not like us. And that's important to understand because it destroys evolution. And that's, why it, that's why these things, no pun intended, are buried. Okay? There's a reason the things that I'm going to show you have been buried. So today my goal is to kind of unearth them and to bring them up to you and to bring about like just a normal a knowledge of some of these artifacts that have been found that give you an understanding of what happened in this old world. But uh, anyway, so, and his brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all such as handled the harp and the organ. As handled the harp and the organ. This man was a master musician. See, you don't, you, you don't, today we have to work our way up and practice and to learn these things. These men already had that intelligence. God had placed them in them, placed it in them. They were advanced. Their world was advanced. More so than what we can really fathom. These are not popular things to talk about with most people because they don't want to believe this because they've been sold on evolution so long that everybody in the past were just a bunch of knuckle-dragon apes and that's all they were and they were just dumb and we're evolving, we're getting better. No, we're not getting better. Right. It's just we're getting worse. All right, so, and Zilla, she also bare Tubalcain, an instructor of every artificer, and brass and iron, and the sister of Tubalcane was Nama. Now, what does it say here? It says, she bare Tubalcane. Does anybody know which, does anybody know which uh, mystery religion holds up Tubalcane as a very central figure? Freemasonry. 
Freemasonry does. Why is that? Because he was a master. He was a master of metal. Yeah, why do you know that? You have the handshake now. Anyway, better not. I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. Never mind. Um, anyway, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that, that, that's one of those things that has to be buried. But, but uh, it just comes up once in a while. Hard to, it just, it segued really well. Anyway, uh, but Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. This was a master instructor of brass and iron. He not only was good at it, he was a master at it, and he taught others. He would have been a master of his art. And then you understand the line of who these men came from. Who were these men of? Yes. Many of them were evil men. Much of, this, this proves a lot. It proves that much of technology came from evil people. And when you study anything to do with modern technology, you find out that, well, I'm going to show you today that modern technology may not be so modern. It may be ancient technology. All right. And, uh, okay, so, and Zil, so Tubal Cain, he was a master of that. And it shows, like, who these people were and what they were a part of and how they were. Um, and, you know, the Masons have a symbol for Tubal Cain. And we won't get into that, but, you know, that's what they have. Anyway, let's pray. Father, Lord, we pray you be with us now. Help us, Lord, as we look through your word. Help us as we look through these things, look through the earth, Lord, as we found these examples everywhere. And, Lord, I pray that the message would just get across and that uh, we would understand that these things have been found for a reason, for your glory, to prove that, to back up, and even though we believe it by faith, Lord, but to prove that you left a record somewhere in this earth of what you did. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. Look at this hammer. You say, well, that's not very, that, that's not very impressive. Well, actually, it is very impressive when you figure out where it came from. This, this hammer is a very, very old hammer that was found. And I'll kind of read you where it was found. In June of 1934, members of the Han family discovered a chunk of limestone rock with wood protruding from it. They chiseled it open, exposing a fascinating hammerhead. A small portion of the hammer was fled down, filed down excuse me, to confirm that it was, in fact, metal. Over the decades, this cut has remained shiny and is not rusted. Well, how is that? How did these people know how to use this, this material? How were they able to do this, this old, and it didn't rust through? Because they knew what they were doing, didn't they? Over the decades, this cut has remained shiny and has not rusted. The artifact was found near London, Texas, by a waterfall on Red Creek. This site is part of a large geographical zone called the Edwards Plateau, and it, it, and it primarily consists of Cretaceous... Cretaceous rock. Several miles upstream, masses of shell fossils are found that match the fossils in this in this uh, concretion. This is the odd. What is this odd little hammer? What is it? The hammer, which has become known as the London artifact, is now part of the collection of Creation Evidence Museum, where it has been extensively analyzed. The handle. The handle has a black and a coal lifted tip. The head is made out of a rare iron mixture with chlorine. So they were mixing metals, and they knew how to use different things with that. These, where, when did this come from? Many scientists have expressed skepticism since the artifact was not found by a professional. See, that's what they do. But what we found is if you call the professionals in, that artifact disappears. Yeah. It's like the bones of, of giants. Everybody calls, well, hey, I think I'll call the Smithsonian. Then they call the Smithsonian, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, it's like Jimmy Hoffa, it's gone. You don't see it ever again, right? Buried with the fishes, I guess. Right. Many scientists have expressed skepticism, but the composition, chlorine fabricated with metallic iron, remains a puzzling enigma. We know that iron was a metal that it was in production in the pre-flood economy. We just read that. The extraordinary resistance to corrosion, even in the Texas humidity, points towards specialized metallurgy. Now, what's interesting about this is this is not all that was found. In fact, in, I think I have the slide in here, but I'm not sure. But in Armenia, they found a whole metallurgical factory preserved where they knew how to use advanced capabilities in metal. Well, do you have any proof that God said that? Yeah, we just read it. 
he said that they were masters of it. Listen to this. Could the, could the rock connection itself have been recently produced in the river? It does not seem that rock matrix surrounding the hammer is of modern origin. There are none of the riverbed gravels embedded in the concretion. Instead, the sand composition matches the Cretaceous source rock upstream. A careful search of the river itself reveals that there are no unabraded shells available in the riverbed, and indeed, very few shells at all. Moreover, the approximately... Ten shells in the rock matrix show no signs of having been reworked, which would indicate a more recent aggregation. So they're saying this is millions of years old, this, this rock, and here's this hammer inside of it. But how could they have made that millions of years ago? How could they figure that? Well, first of all, we know that I'm going to tell you that it's probably somewhere around 5,000 years old and that this was preserved by a flood when God destroyed the whole earth. Look at this. This is called the Dorchester vase. Am I saying that right, Garrett? Because it might sound different if you're from New England. Dorchester. Maybe. I don't know. But anyway. But <laughs> I don't know. They all say things funny over there in New England. But in 1852, construction work in Dorchester, Massachusetts, involved using explosives to break up rock on Meeting House Hill. After the explosion, two broken pieces of an ancient metal vase-like object were recovered from the debris. The bell-shaped vessel has been described as being 4.5 inches high and 6.5 inches wide, as the base curving it only 2.5 inches in diameter at the top. The story of this remarkable find ran in the Boston Transcript, a local paper. Later, the story is repeated in the Scientific American, a relic of a gone-by age. June 5, 1852. It was inferred from the locations of the two pieces of this silver-colored object amongst the debris that this vase has been blasted from the solid pudding stone which makes up the Roxbury Conglomerate approximately 15 feet under the surface of the Meeting House Hill. The Roxbury Conglomerate in which the vase was found is dated by evolutionists to the Eticarian period between 70, 570, and 593 million years old. Now, I want you to notice something about this, though. Look at how well that was made. The detail of that. This is not somebody that was like, okay, I think I'll practice on this. No, this is somebody that understood quite well how to make things and was very, very, very good at it. And what is my explanation? Well, about 5,000 years ago or so, there was a flood that destroyed all there. Is it 4,000 or 5,000? I get that number wrong. I think it's about 40... What's about, about four, is it about four, 4,000 years ago, there was a flood that destroyed the whole earth and buried this world, this advanced world. It's one of the reasons why God destroyed the earth, or, or, uh, or um, destroyed the earth in Genesis chapter 6 that we see in Genesis chapter 7. We see the flood in, in all the way to Genesis chapter 9. We see that God said he's going to destroy the earth. It's one of the reasons why, because they were so advanced in technology that they were moving it forward at a faster pace. And then after the flood, post-flood time, what did they do? Post-flood time, they did the same, they were starting to do the same thing over again. They were going to work as one. And they were going to bring that technology back. How about this iron pot found in coal? It, this also destroys the millions of years theory. It's ridiculous. I mean, it just absolutely destroys it. But that's why you don't hear about these things. These things are, you're not supposed to know about these. That's why you see, why do we see them in articles from 1852 but no modern articles? What happened to all those articles? Well, the rise of Darwinianism and the rise of, of that religion and, and, the, and the hate the absolute hate for creationism led to this. Right. And the, yeah, and nobody wants to talk about this because they don't want to seem like a fool when the facts are right there. But we learned a long time ago that facts don't matter to people who already have their opinions set in stone. Right, Brother Finney? They're going to go with whatever their opinion is, and that's all there is to it. They're, if it doesn't, what scientists do with these things today, they don't, this is observable science, wouldn't you say? I can observe this. It was found in this coal. Okay, that's observable science. How old do I date the coal? Well, you can't have it both ways. Then they'll try to say, well, that's just not possible. No, it is possible because it's there. But I'll tell you that thousands of years ago, there was a flood, and this was all buried. And that's where that came from. And that's why it's there. And that's why it's in coal. That's why it happened that way. Because God has the answer. 
William Roosh published an article, an, an account in the Creation Research Society, Quarterly 7, of a rough cast iron pot that was found in mid-Pennsylvanian coal scam, seam, sorry, coal seam at the municipal electrical plant in Sulphur City, Oklahoma. The artifact is now archived at Creation Evidence Museum. This small implement was embedded inside a single large lump of coal, while other coal artifacts have been found, but few have been well documented or analyzed. In this case, there's a notarized letter documenting the authenticity of this find. He says this, he says, while I was working in the municipal electrical plant in Thomas, Oklahoma in 1912, I came upon a solid chunk, chunk of coal, which was too large to use. I broke it with a sledgehammer. This iron pot fell from the center, leaving the impression or mold of the pot in a piece of coal. Jim Stoll, an employee of the company, witnessed the breaking of the coal and saw the, the, the pot fall out. I traced the source of the coal and found that it came from Wilburton, Oklahoma mines. Interesting. There it is. That doesn't look like somebody didn't know what they were doing. That looks like somebody knew exactly what they were doing. They weren't practicing in, in school. I think they had it figured out, wouldn't you say? Pretty good. You can, you can see and how old it is, and the coal perfectly preserved it. Interesting. Here's his letter. I mean, he wanted a sworn affidavit that he, that he, that he, had, it, that he had it right. Now, uh, uh, an interesting thing, a lot of things have been found in coal. A ton of things have been found in coal. As we, as we, read the, as we go through history, uh, in Peoria, Illinois, there were coins that they broke open the coal, and they found a coin, and the Madonna... Isis, Horus, Set, you know, um, that mother-son worship was in that coin. Like, how'd that get to Peoria? Why was that stuck in a lump of coal? Another thing, a boy was, was doing what he normally did. They, you know, they took the coal and they heated their house with it. They scoop it up, boom, a chunk falls on the ground, out comes this gold necklace. I didn't know apes had gold necklaces and made them with, that, with such precision. Okay, here's this gold bell. Now, now, take a look at this bell. This is an amazing piece, absolutely amazing. In 1944, as a 10-year-old boy, Newton Anderson was fueling the coal furnace at his parents' home. He dropped a lump of coal onto the basement floor and broke it in half, revealing that it contained this bell inside. The bituminous coal that was mined near his house in Upshur County, West Virginia, is supposed to be about 300 million years old. See, they can't have it both ways. They'll be like, well, no, you know, it didn't really come from that. It probably came from something else and blah, blah, blah. Why? What's this kid go? Why would this kid make up this story? Oh, I just busted a piece of coal and out come this bell. He doesn't know how old the coal is. He doesn't know where it came from. He doesn't know anything about any of that stuff. What is, what is a brass bell with an iron clapper doing in coal ascribed to the Carboniferous period? According to Norm Sharbaugh, his book, Ammunition, which includes several coal antidotes, the bell is an antediluvian artifact made before the Genesis flood. The Institute for Creation Research had the bell submitted to the lab of the University of Oklahoma. There, a nuclear activation analyst, a analysis revealed that the bell contains an unusual mix of metals different from any known modern alloy production. Listen, including copper, zinc, tin, Arsenic, iodine, and selenium. Genesis 4.22 states that Tubalcane was an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. Perhaps when, this, when his civilization came to an end in the flood, one of his bells was buried with a mass of vegetation that became coal and ended up, a thousand, up thousands of years later in Newt Anderson's coal bin. The bell was prominently featured in 1992 CBS docudrama production called Ancient Secrets of the Bible and is now part of the Genesis Park collection. Later on, Newton Anderson spent a great deal of time researching the figure atop the bell. He discovered the similarities to the Babylonian southwest wind demon called Pazuzu. The demon typically is shown with a prominent headpiece like the bell figure in D like the bell figure. Indeed, the bell headpiece clearly is broken off, signifying that it may have been quite a bit taller. The Hindu deity, Garuda, is sometimes depicted on top of bells, as is the ancient Isis, Egyptian Isis. The kneeling posture with hands clasped 
is quite like Garuda representations. Because of this, some have argued that it must be an Indian Ganta bell, but ancient religious worship seems to take on similar forms in various cultures. Wait a minute, how is that? For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. There have always been two spirits. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience and the spirit that leads the children of God as the sons of God. There have always been two. There really only are two religions in this world. There really are only two. There's that perfect religion that James talks about, which is the Word of God, which is Christ, biblical Christianity, and there is Babylonian satanic worship. And whatever forms they take on, they are all the same. They're not different. And what are they all pointing to? The showdown of all the ages that is coming. Nimrod tried to bring it about. You say, what, how, could they, how could they have the mother-daughter worship? How could this wind demon be there? How could it be the same as all this? Well, a long time ago, all the earth was of one language. And they had one world religion. And a man named Nimrod was trying to rule the world. And God saw the tower that the children of men had built, and he came down, and he confounded their languages. That's why you have the same story. That's why you have the same story the flood told in different, from different viewpoints and a little bit twist, a twist in each one of them in every culture. Why? Because it happened. Right. But it all leads to a record. Okay? Anyway, so this bell, there you go. There's the image on top of the bell right there. See that? And you can, you can match these. Listen, you have to understand something about the mystery religions, okay? They, they don't use words as much as they use symbols. And if you learn to understand the symbols, then you understand who they are or whose they are. They don't have to have the same language. They're speaking the same language. The language is the mystery religion. The language is the symbols. That's the language. That's why we can see a coin that's thousands of years old that shows the mother-son worship. And we say, wait a minute, but that wasn't Rome. Of course not. Rome didn't get it from Rome. Rome got it from the spirit of Babylon, and it's a traveling spirit. That spirit ends up in Israel. That spirit ends up everywhere, right? In, in Israel, it's Baal worship, right? It's there, though. It's the same spirit. In Hinduism, it's the same spirit. You know it by its symbols. These, are, these were the defiers of God. These were the ones that mounted up a war against God. This is what their goal was. This is what they were doing. That's what they wanted to do. Here's his letter. He took a polygraph. So I'll take a polygraph. Newton R. Anderson voluntarily, agree, voluntarily agreed to take a polygraph examination. Prior to the test, Mr. Anderson signed a form stating he was taking the test voluntarily. The document has been retained in the examiner's file. Mr. Anderson is approximately 73 years old. He has the medical conditions of narcolepsy and catalepsy, which he developed at, the very, at a very early age. Mr. Anderson is currently taking the medication Ritalin and also medication for high blood pressure. The main issue under consideration was to determine whether or not Mr. Anderson was truthful in his responses to the relevant test questions. They asked him these questions. Did you find the bell in question encased in coal, as you described? His response, yes. Is the bell you sold to David Watzel the identical one you found encased in coal? Yes. Did you give false information as to how you found the bell in question? No. All, uh, at this time, a polygraph examination was administered to determine Mr. Anderson's truthfulness to the relevant test questions. The examiner's opinion, Mr. Newton, R. Anderson, was truthful to the relevant test question. No deception was indicated. This is called an Iraqi battery. That's what they call it nowadays, okay? This was actually a battery that they found. Now, this is a, a diagram, but I'll show you the actual battery in a second. But this is how this battery breaks down. This is an ancient battery. They knew how to use it. Look how they put it together. And it worked. See, I, I can hardly believe that. Why? You think you're smarter than they were? Is that, is that it? Is that, is that why? 
You think in all of our evolutionary teaching and everything else that, that, that we have acquired that knowledge and we are so much farther advanced than those knuckle-dragon apes that were back then? So God, when he created Adam perfect, and in his image he created Adam, and Adam named all the, could you name all the animals? Look, they have names for all the animals now, and I can't name them. There's encyclopedias, and I can't even pronounce them. You bring all these animals, I'll be like, what is this? I don't know what it is. But everything Adam br was brought to Adam and Adam, and God saw what he would name him. And God just, oh, I'm going to watch him name all these. God knew what he was going to name. God knows everything. But God let Adam do it. Why? Because Adam was to have dominion over them. Adam named them. Think about that. So is it a far stretch that they could make a battery? Looks like they knew what they were doing, doesn't it? There it is. Yes, they did. We'll get to that. You be quiet, Aaron. No more talking. Mute him out, please. But look at this. You say, I, I can't believe that. Well, you've got a probably a 4,000-year-old battery there, 3,000-year-old battery there. Can you see it okay, brother? Okay. 50 years ago, the director of the Baghdad Museum, William Koenig, reported the discovery of an electric battery 2,000 years old, he said. You had not heard about this sensational discovery? We can tell you why. It did not fit in with the established viewpoint, and most archaeologists did not want, to know, want you to know about it. They hoped it would go away, but Koenig's electric battery did not go away. In fact, a lot more of them were found in Parthian settlements near Baghdad. The battery Koenig discovered consisted of a pottery jar 14 centimeters, 5.5 inches high, and 8 centimeters, 3 inches in diameter, with a 3.3 centimeter, 1.5 inches opening at the top. Inside this opening and held in place with asphalt was a tube made of a copper sheet. The tube was sealed at the bottom with a copper disc held in place with the more asphalt. Suspended from the asphalt lid was an iron rod which hung down inside the center of the copper roll. What's interesting about this is you say, well, it only produced a certain amount of amps. So you know what they figured out? Or they already knew. We'll just make a bunch of them and put them all together. And then we'll get a power source and we'll take that power source and we'll charge it all through. That's what they did, because they have history of it. They found it. The use of this asphalt ceiling indicated that the, con the contraption must have contained some liquid. At that time, virtually all available liquids, apart from vegetable mineral oils, were acidic. So the logical conclusion was that the pottery jar and its contents were for the production of an electric current. Vinegar was the most l likely acid that would have been used, but it was the purpose to which, but what was the purpose which this current could be used? Well, they weren't sure about that. About the only likely explanation was that it was used for electroplating. But no electroplated items have ever been found. In any case, there is a lot more to electro electroplating than the production of mild electrical current. Many people believe that it was used in medical therapy. You know, we, I, when I go to the chiropractor, there's, there's, uh, he has this machine that he puts, this thing that he puts on my back, and it, it, uses, it's a, a, Josh, a stim machine, right? Is that what it's called? Stim, it has electric current, and it goes that area, and if you put it on that area, it causes healing to it. It causes it to heal faster because it, it takes things to that point, and it causes it to heal. Well, my Cairo knew that, and people know that now, but I think they knew it back then. I think they understood that very well, and they used that for medical therapy. Paul T. Kaiser of the University of Alberta in Canada has come up with an alternative suggestion. Writing in the prestigious Archaeological Journal of Near Eastern Studies, he claims that these batteries were used as analgesic. He points out that there is a different, uh, there's evidence that electrical eels were used to numb an area of pain. To provide like an anesthesia for medical treatment. The electrical battery could have provided a less messy and more readily available method of Analgesic. Of course, the 1.5 volts that would have been generated by such a device would not do much to deaden a patch of skin. So the next conclusion was that these ancient people must have discovered how to link up several batteries in a series to produce a higher voltage. 
Paul Kaiser says that Mesopotamian medical practice included a number of elements conducive to the reception of an electrical therapy device of this sort. In Samaria, Akkad, and Babylon, there were two types of physicians, the Asu and the Asupu. The latter practiced diagnosis of the patient's symptoms or divination to determine the nature of the affliction. The former prescribed the medicine or used incantations to provide healing. They may have been the ones to apply electrical currents to the patient's stricken parts. Some believe maybe it was ancient acupressure. Or the elect this electrical fish they might have used, electrical eel. In Greek and Roman times, they used them for relieving headaches and gout. We, you know, we really just think we're smarter than everybody else. We're evolving, getting better. Well, here's, here's something you might have used it for. Here's the light bulb. See this? This light bulb-like object engraved in a crypt under the Temple of Hathor in Egypt. Now, why did they put this on the wall there? You can see it has a cord and everything, and it goes out. Well, why would they put that there? You know, how come, we be, how come we are so apt to believe what evolutionists and doctors and everybody say, but we don't really want to believe the Word of God when we see observable science here that, hey, these guys were drawing something about what they knew. A relief beneath the Temple of Hathor in, in Dendery, Egypt, depicts figures standing around a large light bulb-like object. Aaron von Donneken, who wrote Chariots of the Gods, create, created a model of the bulb which works when connected to a power source, emanating an, emanating an eerie purplish light. Yeah. Yeah. They knew exactly what they were doing. Where did they get this technology from? Well... I believe some of them worked with devils. I believe some of them were, obviously they were advanced already. But I believe when they got into the dark arts, they were working with devils right before the flood. And after the flood, after the flood, I believe they went into walls like this and found the spells, the incantations, the astrology, everything they needed to try to reproduce it. The only problem was the environment was different when they got off the boat. And God then confounded their languages to destroy that mystery. So what did they do? Well, I believe what they did was write in symbols because they could not read each other's language. So they took the symbols and they wrote the symbols. And they all knew what the symbols meant. And then generations later, we don't know what the symbols meant. We had to learn what they meant. But they already knew. It's like this. We had to figure out what this is. They already knew what it was. Do you understand that? It took us this amount of time to figure out that's a light bulb. Do you understand that? 500 years ago when somebody saw this, they didn't say, well, that's a light bulb. They said, what's wrong with those idiots? What'd they put that on the wall for? That don't even make any sense. But now we have light bulbs, and we're like, hey, I know what that is. That's a light bulb. You get it? This is a site of a nuclear reactor. This is an ancient site. They found this digging around. In, in 1972, a French factory imported uranium ore from Oklahoma in Africa's Gabon Republic. The uranium had already been extracted. Wait a minute, they're extracting uranium? They found the site of origin to have apparently functioned as a large-scale nuclear reactor that came into being 1.8 billion years ago and was in operation for some 500,000 years. Oh, yeah. So what do you think, preacher? Well, I think at the time of the flood, I think that's what they were doing. You see... I want you to go to Genesis chapter 6. You and I think with our Western civilized mind, or uncivilized, whichever you want to say, and we don't really think biblically. If you think biblically and you read this, you know that God said, these people are evil, and I'm going to destroy them. Because their capabilities are awful. 
what they can do. They had demonic ability, plus the, they were using the environment. They were using their superior intellect, their superior si- size, the help of devils. They were fallen angels, they, giants. We're not going to get into them today, but we're going to talk about them again. Ready? And it came to pass... When men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children of them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. These mighty men, not just mighty in stature, mighty in intellect, mighty in their deeds. What does the Bible say about Nimrod? He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That word mighty means Gabor. That's the word Gabor. It means giant. I don't even have enough information to give you today because I forgot to put it in here, but I'll get to it, I think, when I talk about the advanced civilization uh, or the advanced, uh, their minds and everything. But they were doing genetic testing. They knew how to do it. They had DNA on the walls. How did they have that? How did they know how to do that? Because when we looked at that, we are like, hey, what's that funny art they're doing right there? What's wrong with those knuckle dragon apes? How'd they figure out how to do that? Cavemen. Y'all bunch of cave monkeys. I think we're more like the cave monkeys. And I think they had an advanced intelligence and understood exactly what they were doing. Because it took us thousands of years to figure out, hey, that was a light bulb. Hey, they're mining uranium. Okay, Dr. Glenn T. Oh, let me, let me finish. I'm sorry. There were giants in the earth in those days. We read that. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Well, the wickedness of man is great in the earth now, isn't it? Not to the level as it was there. Not to that level. And that every, every, look, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Friend. If God let you live out your imagination, would it be a bad world? Do you understand? They were living out with the capabilities to live out their imagination. And they were doing it. And they weren't using it for good. They were using it for evil. Dr. Glenn T. Seaborg former head of the United States Atomic Energy Commission and Nobel Prize winner for his work in synthesis of heavy elements, explained why he believes it, wasn't a natural, it was not a natural phenomenon and thus must be a man-made nuclear reactor. For uranium to burn in a reaction, very precise conditions are needed. Now look at this. The water must be extremely pure for one. Much purer than exists naturally. The material U-235 is necessary for nuclear fission to occur. It is one of the isotopes found naturally in uranium. Several specialists in reactor engineering have said they believe the uranium in Oklahoma could not have been rich enough in U-235 for a reaction to take place naturally, which means they purified the water. They had pure water. They took it there, and they mined it. They knew what they were doing. Well, how could that be? Well... There was an advanced civilization, and every imagination of their heart was only evil continually, and God said, I will destroy man from off the face of the earth. And he destroyed him, and he buried that world. Hey, look at this. This is a portion of the Pyra Pyra Rees map of 1513. There's something very interesting about this map. What is it? I'll show you. A map created by Turkish Admiral cartographer Piriz Riz in 1513, but sourced from various early maps. This is how we understand that these people, where'd this guy get this map? He got it from another map. But what's so unique about it? 
is thought by some to depict Antarctica as it was in, vi- in a very remote, remote age before it was covered with ice. He had a map of a map. A landmass is shown to jut out from the southern coastline of South America. Captain Lorenzo W. w. Burroughs, a U.S. Air Force captain in the cartograph section, wrote a letter to Dr. Charles Hapgood in 1961 saying that this landmass seems to accurately show Antarctica's coast as it is under the ice. Dr. Hapgood was one of the first to publicly suggest that Paris Rees may depict Antarctica during a prehistoric time. He was a Harvard-educated historian whose theories about geological shifts earned the admiration of Albert Einstein. He hypothesized that the land masses shifted, explaining why Antarctica is shown as connected to South America. Now, there's a theory about that, and there's Bible for it, that says this, that in the days of Peleg, God divided the earth. Some say, well, that was the languages. I don't think so. He already said he divided those. He confounded their languages. This is the earth. I believe he divided. Now, what happened? I believe when he divided this earth, follow me now, when he divided it, it further buried that world and their technology after the flood. I believe that's what happened. The landmass shifted. I believe that. There's some people that would dispute that, but I, I don't think, I, I think it's very plainly stated in the Bible that he divided the earth in those days. Well, with their, yeah, with their language barrier done, they were all speaking Greek, right? So they didn't know what they were saying. Right. But God, they had to spread out. They had to leave each other. They couldn't stay because there was nothing. I mean, they couldn't communicate with each other. So those that could communicate with each other, they left and went with, and they migrated to different areas. But when God divided the earth, guess what happened? It shows Antarctica in prehistoric times. But, but in their understanding of this, though, people rule out the Bible and everything that God said. Why? Because they don't want it to be true. Because if there's a God in heaven, then I have to submit to him. All right, how about ancient computers? Look at this. What in the world is that? Well, that's what scientists have called an ancient computer. Kind of interesting, isn't it? A 2,000-year-old computing device may change the way we think about ancient civilizations. The mechanical star positioning instrument was discovered in a shipwreck at the turn of the 20th century, and until recently, no one had figured out how it worked. Research from Cardiff University in conjunction with the National Archaeological Museum of Athens and the University of Athens at Thessalonica suggests that the device is more sophisticated than anyone previously thought and that Greek technology was far more advanced than previously thought. The device was able to track the motions of the sun and moon, even predicting eclipses. Now, now file that in your brain for a second, because when we get to the end of this presentation, you watch the video I'm going to show you for two minutes, that is going to matter to you. Remember, there's two religions. The irregular orbit of the moon and possibly the positions of the planets. The wood and bronze device was named the Anatictheria mechanism after the Aegean island near where it was discovered. The researchers recreated 70 pieces, including 30 gears, some of which are differential gears, a concept that was not rediscovered until modern times. So wait a minute, they knew how to use differential gears and it took us all this time and then we, like, we, we figured it out? Yeah. So much for our superiority, right? It, it makes you believe that, you know what? God did tell us that he made Adam upright. But man has sought out many evil inventions. The wood bronze device, he said at 70, okay, at 70, re- recreating the device was difficult and painstaking. Why? Should be easy. I mean, it was, after all, it's just a bunch of dummies that made it. How could it be that hard? Right? Involving the expertise of, look at this, look, 
Look what he says. Involving the expertise of astronomers, mathematicians, computer specialists, script analysts, and conservation experts. Whoa. Really? All those people that come together to make this little device? And some guy just made it. Professor Mike Edmonds of the School of Physics at Cardiff said, the way the mechanics are designed just makes your jaw drop. The historical paradigm that man has gradually evolved a smarter and larger brain over vast periods of time stands in contrast to the biblical history, which holds that mankind was created fully human from the beginning with a fully developed human brain. However, because of sin, mankind has actually been de-evolving, devolving ever since. Bible believers should not be surprised to find evidence of advanced technology from the ancient world, in this case dating from before the time of Christ. The millennia-old computer, along with many other previous discoveries, is another example that our current understanding may actually not be as advanced or anti antiquated as our antiquated, antiquated predecessors. Excuse me, my tongue's tied. What's this? It's a wall. <laughs> it's just a wall. No, it's actually... It's actually an advanced wall, and the design of it is very old, and it's been preserved, and they were like, wait a minute, this is really old. Where it's been encrusted, where it's been put, it's really old, so how in the world can this wall be there, and who made it? Workers at a stone quarry near Axian Province, France, in the 18th century came across tools stuck in a layer of limestone 50 feet underground. Just stuck there. What would have stuck it there? A flood. The a worldwide flood. The find was recorded in the American Journal of Science and Arts in 1820 by T.D. Porter, who was translating Count Burnin's work, Mineralogy. The wooden instruments had turned into a gate or a hard stone. Porter wrote this, Everything tended to prove that this work had been executed upon the spot where the traces existed. The presence of man had then preceded the formation of this stone that, the very that very considerably he was already arrived at such a degree of civilization that the arts were known to him and that he wrought the stone and formed columns out of it. That's not supposed to happen according to evolution. As stated in the case of the hammer above, the limestone has been known to form relatively quickly around modern tools. What's this? Well, that's a spark plug on the one side. That's a spark plug, and so is that. Those are both spark plugs. These are our spark plugs. That was their spark plugs. It's called the Caso artifact. Creationists have often been criticized for failing to present. Now, this is not by a Christian, by the way, but I want to read you this because he, tell, he actually tells mostly the truth here. Creationists have often been criticized for failing to present original research and evidence that would overthrow our contemporary scientific view of human origins. However, this is not entirely fair. The creation science, field known as uparts or out-of-place artifacts, is a lively area of study that relies on anomalous finds in the archaeological record to challenge scientific chronologies, and modes of human evolution. In this paper, we will examine one of them. So the story of the Caso artifact the Koso artifact, has been embellished over the years, he says, but nearly all accounts of the actual discovery are basically the same. See how they double talk? Hear the hiss of a serpent? Listen, you can hear it. On February 13, 1961, Wallace Lane, Virginia Maxey, and Mike Mikesell were seeking interesting mineral specimens, particularly geodes, for their L, M, and V rock hounds gem and gift shop in California. The trio was about six miles northwest of Olancha, near the top of a peak about 4,300 feet in elevation and about 350 feet above the dry bed of Owens Lake. At lunchtime, after collecting rocks most of the morning, all three placed their specimens in the rock sack Mike Sell was carrying. The next day in the gift shop's workroom, Mike Sell ruined a nearly new diamond saw blade while cutting what he thought was a geode. Inside the cut nodule... Mike Sell did not find the cavity that is typical of geodes, but a perfectly circular section of a very hard white material that appeared to be porcelain. In the center of the porcelain cylinder was a two-millimeter shaft of bright metal. The metal shaft responded to a magnet. Uh-oh. There were either odd, there were other odd qual qualities about the specimen. The outer layer of the specimen was encrusted with fossil shells and their fragments. 
In addition to shells, the discoverers noticed two non-magnetic metallic objects in the cursed, resembling a nail and a washer. Stranger still, the inner layer was a hexagonal and seemed to form a casing around the hard porcelain cylinder. Within the inner layer, a layer of decomposing copper surrounded the porcelain cylinder. What is this? It's a spark plug. That's what it is. That's what they came up with. Very little is known about the initial physical inspection of the artifact. They examined it. They said the specimen. The module had taken at least 500,000 years to attain its present form. You don't say. However, the identity of the first ge geologist is still a mystery. So there are people that, and Ron Callis was a, a creationist. He observed it. To have physically inspected the artifact, and he was allowed to record the images of the nodule using both X-ray and natural light photography. Callias's X-rays brought interest in the artifact to a new level. The X-ray of the upper end of the object seemed to reveal some sort of tiny spring or helix. Info Journal editor Ronald J. W w Willis speculated that it could be the remains of a corroded piece of metal with threads. Well, what they don't want to say is this is what it looks like. Okay, this is, this is breaking it, the image down. This is what it looks like. They don't want to say that's a spark plug because, of course, those knuckle dragon apes couldn't have figured out how to do that. They hadn't attained our knowledge yet. So there's no way they could have had a spark plug. Oh, no, I think they understood it very well. You know, I, I think they understood it very well. They understood what that was and how to use it because they made it that way. That didn't just form in, in that lime. So they didn't just form that way. In that geode, all right? It just didn't form that way. And then, oh, well, the copper came together, and it got legs, and it walked up, and then the other piece walked up, and then the porcelain, they all got together and just froze there. Yeah. You kiss the frog, and it turns to a prince or whatever, something, I don't know. That doesn't work that way. What happened? They made it. Somebody made it and used it, and they knew what it was for. And it took us thousands of years to figure it out, how to make a spark plug. Okay? Which should show you that we're not that bright. And give us a dependence upon God Almighty and not our own intellect. All right, this is, uh, I don't know why, I put this out of place, and I'm sorry. It says out of place artifacts, and this slide is out of place, so it goes along with it. All right, and if you, if you want a mixer, there's one right there. <laughs> Free advertisement for a mixer. Right there. That one's kind of high. Man, Aaron's got one cheaper than that if anybody wants one. No, I'm just I think he sold his already. I don't know. Anyway, anyway uh, Bahama, okay, archaeologist William Donato was conduct, has conducted multiple dives. Okay, so this man, I'm going to show you a picture of this in a minute here. I'm sorry it's out of place, but there was a dive that took place a few of them, and he went down and he, do he dove down off the coast here of the Bahamas, and what did he find? He found a structure some 12,000 to 19,000 years old, built to protect a prehistoric settlement from waves. Hmm. He found it to be a multi-tiered structure, including prop stones that appear to be placed there by human hands. Well, duh. What would you think? Monkeys put it there? Man, for being smart, they're kind of dumb. He also, yeah, crabs did. <laughs> he also found what he believes to be anchor stones with rope holes in them. Yeah, they probably knew how to use anchor stones. I'm sure they sailed and everything. So, yeah, that makes sense. Dr. Eugene Shin, a retired geologist who worked for the U.S. Geological Survey, has said core rock samples he took show a dip toward deep water. If all the cores show a dip toward deep water, that would prove the rock formed where it is and did not form elsewhere later to be transported by humans to its present location. What is he doing? Speaking out of both sides of his mouth, basically. That's what he does. What happened? That's it right there. How'd that get there? Well, I would say a flood. Something like a worldwide flood that took place and perfectly, and then the shift that took place in the days of Peleg, and I think that's why it's there. And it's underground, and, it's, and they knew what it was for, and it was designed in such a way you have to understand the engineering that these people did is like we can't even figure it out. Look how many people it took to put that, make that little computer, to replicate that little computer. It took mathematicians, astronomers, everybody, and one person probably made that long ago. 
Why? Because they knew what they were doing. They understood. See, to you and I, it doesn't seem like a big deal to build that wall, but these guys that investigate this, they're like, this is huge. How'd they do this? How'd they know how to do this? And how'd they move that rock? And that rock was very heavy. How did they work with that rock? Well, we're not going to talk about that today, but we will talk about that sometime. Because there are rocks that weigh tons and tons and tons that were used to build many of these things. And how did they get them there? Well, I have a few theories, but I'm not going to give them to you today. There's the light bulb again. There's the light bulb again. Yes, and giants, by the way. If you notice some of the depictions, which I'm not going to get into today, but the giants are sitting, the, 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 men, the giants are sitting down and the people are head level with them as they're seated. Or the man is taller as he's seated than them. If they stood up, they would tower over them. Now, notice the precision of all this. I honestly don't believe we could do this now. I don't think we could. I don't think we can make that. I do not believe that we know how to make that like that. The architecture, it's not as good. The design, I, I think it would be a problem. Okay, let's talk about some science here. I don't know if I have a picture of this, but I want to read this to you. This is called the Agasta Sanhita. What is this? This is an old Sumerian text. Sumerian text. And in it, they describe how to make batteries. And it was translated into English so we could understand it. A place, is, he says this, he says, place, by the way, this is thousands of years old, this text. Thousands of years old. Place a well-cleansed copper plate in an earth, earth, earthenware vessel. Cover it first by copper sulfate and then by moist sawdust. After that, put a mercury, mercury amalgamated zinc sheet on top of the sawdust to avoid polarization. The contact will produce an energy known by the twin name of Mitra Varuna. Note, when a cell was prepared according to the Agastya Sanhita and measured... It gives open circuit voltage of 1.138 volts and short circuit current as 23 MA. I don't know what that means. Thank you. Good thing we have an electrician here today. Water can be split into oxygen and hydrogen. Water will be split by this current into pron value oxygen and udon value hydrogen. A chain of 100 jars is said to give a very effective force. How did these guys know how to do that? Why were they using it? What were they using it for? The Udian value hydrogen thus created can be trapped into an airtight object. If this is achieved, it is possible to build a structure capable of flying in air. Now, I did not get, well, maybe I did get this in there. Let me see. Did I get it in there? Nope. That's it. Okay. This is, uh, this is what they created, by the way. Formula for Electric Battery in Agastya Samhita, Ancient Indian Text. Zinc powder, wet sawdust, copper plate, earthen pot, boom. There you go. Seems like they knew what they were doing. This is him again. This is, now, by the way, we all know these guys are occultists. All right? Hindus, they're occultic. The stuff they believe. They... They talk about the chakra, the aura. I mean, all of it. We're not going to get into that, but that's what they talk about. Let's talk about airplanes. Now, there are many, and I'll talk about this probably in a separate one. There are many, 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 many examples in history and stories of people flying. Many. Many. Now, do you believe that? Do you believe that those people possibly in that pre-flood world knew what they were doing and were able to put something together? Well, they designed this. The object, the object shown in the sketch was found in 1898 in a tomb of Sa Saqqara, Egypt, and was later dated as having been created near 200 BCE. As airplanes were known Unknown in the days when it was found, it was thrown into a box marked Wooden Bird Model and then stored in the basement of a Cairo museum. It was rediscovered by Dr. Khalil 
who studied models made by ancients. The discovery was considered so important by the Egyptian government that a special committee of leading scientists was established to study the object. As a result of their findings, a special exhibit was set up in the center hall of Cairo Museum with a little model as its centerpiece. It was even labeled as a model airplane. To elucidate the reason of the de decision of the committee, almost unprecedented in the field of archaeology, let's consider some of the aspects of the model. The model has the exact proportions of a very advanced form of a pusher glider that is still having some bugs ironed out. The type of glider will stay in the air almost by itself. Even a very small engine will keep it going at low speeds, as low as 45 to 65 miles per hour. While it can carry an enormous payload, the ability is dependent on the curious shape of wings and their proportions. The tipping of the wings downward, a reverse hedral wing, as it is called, is the feature behind the capability. A similar type of curving wings are implemented on the Concordia airplane, giving the airplane a maximum life lift excuse me, without detracting from its speed. So over 2,000 years old, by the way, there's older ones than this that they found. But this is, this is perfectly preserved. And it's from the, they say, from the pre-Columbian Colombian airplane models. Is the concept of the airplane limited to Egypt? That doesn't seem to be the case. Gold trinkets were found in an area covering Central America and coastal areas of South America, estimated to belong to a period between 500 and 800 CE. But since they are made from gold, accurate dating is impossible. And based essentially on straight strategy, stratigraphy, which may be deceptive. However, we could safely say these gold objects are more than 1,000 years old. Well, they don't want to tell you the truth. They're more than 4,000 years old, and they were around before the flood, and they were probably using, they, these were a model, but I believe they were using planes. The Chinese write about people flying over in their ancient, ancient documents. Others, the Sumerians, I believe, and others, they write about ancient aircrafts that were flying over. They, they, they write in their history about these men came flying in, defeated them, destroyed their armies, and flew back and left. Yeah. Do you believe that could be possible? I believe so. I believe it's possible. There's another picture of it. Look at the precision on that. Now, Dan, you make stuff with wood and other things like that. Look at that. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? Man. For Knuckle Dragon Apes, they knew what they were doing. Now, this is the last thing, and this is very interesting. Jacob, my Irish friend over here. I, I was telling Jacob, I think I told you this, Jacob, that if, if we were... If we were like those one street preachers for Halloween, you'd be my little leprechaun. I'd have you at the end of the gold, the gold, the you know, the pot of gold, the end of the rainbow. And then we, yeah, we, yeah, we just. If I was like Reuben Israel and those guys, no, I'm just kidding. Right? I'd get him in a little leprechaun outfit, Lucky Charms outfit. I'd have my box of Lucky Charms holding up. <laughs> Good thing we don't do gimmick preaching, right, brother? All right, New Grange, what is this? This is the last thing I have to show you, and I'm going to show you a little video on this, okay? This is crazy. When I found this, I was like, whoa. All right, I read this pre-flood civilization book, and I was like, wow. Okay, this is over 5,000 years old. They estimated that, 5,000 years old. But what it is and what they used it for, and look at how they made it. It is creepy. And I'll tell you why. New Grange is 5,200 years old, pa a passage tomb located in the Boyne Valley in Ireland's ancient east. New Grange was built by Stone Age farmers. Stone Age. Hmm, cavemen. The, the mound is 85 meters, 93 yards in diameter, and 13.5 meters, 15 yards high, an area of about one acre. A passage, a passage measuring 19 meters leads into a chamber with three alcoves. The passage and chamber, now listen, are aligned with the rising of the sun at the winter solstice. Why? 
because they worship the sun and they worship the elements and the earth and they were Satanist and they knew how to build that and they built it exactly the way they wanted it and they built it in the to time with the equinox, with the with the solstice, with the eclipse and everything else. And they did it because it was the height of their power and they used it for that purpose and it was a temple and it was used for that. And it survived the flood. Okay, New, New Grange is surrounded by 97 large stones called curbstones, some of which are engraved with megalithic art. The most striking is the entrance stone. Access to the New Grange monument is via the Bruna Boina Visitor Center. New Grange is a Stone Age Neolithic monument in the Boyne Valley County, Meath. It is the jewel in the crown of Ireland's ancient east. Parentheses, pagan. It is idolatry. It is a wicked temple. And if Ireland wanted to be right with God, they would tear it down. Amen. But it's protected. Wicked. Witchcraft. Idolatry. Absolutely wicked place. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's go back. Uh, New Grange was constructed about 5,200 years ago, 3,200 B.C., which makes it older than Stonehenge and the Great Pyramids of Giza. New Grange is a large circular mound, 85 meters. Okay, we read that already. I won't read that to you again. Okay, so New Grange was built by a farming community, they say, that prospered on the rich lands of the Boyne Valley. Noth and Delth are similar mounds that, that together with New Grange have been designated a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. Well, isn't that special? Who, is all, who, else, who remembers who was connected to UNESCO? Huxley, that's right. Huxley. Why? Because they all speak the same language. God haters. What did Nim Nimrod's, many believe that Nimrod's name meant, I will avenge my forefathers. Who were his forefathers? Babylon was the gate of the gods. Can't make it up, folks. New Grange is best known for the illumination of its passage in chambers by the winter solstice sun. It's kind of weird. Above the entrance to the passage of New Grange, there is an opening called a roof box. The baffling orifice ha held a great surprising for those who unearthed it. Its purpose is to allow sunlight, listen, to penetrate the chamber of the shortest days of the year around December 21st, the winter solstice. At dawn from December 19th to the 23rd, a narrow beam of light penetrates the roof box and reaches the floor of the chamber, gradually extending to the rear of the chamber. As the sun rises higher, the beam widens within the chamber so that the whole room becomes dramatically illuminated. This event lasts for 17 minutes, beginning around 9 a.m. The accuracy of the new Grange the accuracy of New Grange as a time-telling device is remarkable. Now listen to what they say. When one considers that it was built 500 years before the Great Pyramids and more than 1,000 years before Stone Edge, you'll listen to the video that I show you. They're like, we just can't figure out how they knew how to do that. I can. God told us. The intent of Stone Age farmers who built New Grange was undoubtedly to mark the beginning of the new year. No, they were pagans, and they were worshiping the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, everything that God told them not to worship, and all the host of heaven, right? Witchcraft, the elements, Satan worship. It may, it may have served a powerful symbol, the victory of life over death. You mean the sun rising? You mean Isis Horus Set? You mean the same religion, only a different language? Yeah, well, how'd they figure out that whole Isis Horus Set thing in a different language? I mean, so you got these Ireland people over here, and these ancient 5,000 years ago, they're doing the same thing with the sun and the rising and everything, the ley lines, and they understood how everything worked and all that stuff. And then you've got over in Babylon, you have them doing that. And then you have over here, you have them doing that. And then you have Baal worship over here. And you have all this. How are they all doing the same thing? Because they all spoke the same language, and God confounded their languages, and that's why he did it, and that's why he destroyed the first world, and he's going to destroy this one, 
and burn the elements with fervent heat. That's why, and he's going to cleanse it once more. Okay, so you ready? Let's see if this works. Out of the mists of the Stone Age, this structure has stood since the dawn of recorded history. This rounded tomb called Newgrange has stood on the bend of Ireland's River Boyne for more than 5,000 years. It is massive, distinct, and very mysterious. The mound of earth covers a rock passageway, which leads to a central chamber where the ashes and bones of the dead were placed. Long thought to be just a tomb, in the late 1960s, archaeologists uncovered an amazing secret that shed new light on this ancient structure. On the winter solstice, the longest night and shortest day of the year, a shaft of light enters a perfectly positioned window and lights up the 60-foot corridor that leads to the basin of ancestral bones. An impressive feat of engineering, considering its Stone Age builders possessed only rudimentary technologies. It's particularly important because it's been proven without doubt that it was very deliberately aligned to sunrise at the winter solstice. Its facade is of white quartz, restored by archaeologists who believe the mound was originally covered in a smooth stone that reflected the light. The massive stones in the interior were perhaps pulled from the river. The builders probably moved the boulders into position by rolling them on logs. Archaeologists believe it took decades to construct Newgrange. And since life expectancy was short, only about 40 years, the project likely was handed down from generation to the next. Little is known about the Neolithic farming community that created this structure. Why they built it is still a mystery. Perhaps the mound was a place of worship. Historians admit they just don't know. We know they were used as burial places, but we also think they would have been used as places for ritual gatherings, where a focus for community gatherings, a um, place to honour the ancestors. For more than 5,000 years, Newgrange has captured the rising sun of the winter solstice. It's a lasting monument to human ingenuity and to a desire as old as mankind. Even then, people strove to understand great forces of nature and to harness them, even if only for a brief moment in time. Okay, all right, good. Now, let me say this, a few things here that she said. One, she said their lifespan was only 40 years. No, and they passed it down to generation. No, men that lived 900 years built that thing. It wasn't passed down generation to generation of them, and they weren't a bunch of uh, knuckle-dragging apes that were trying to figure out how to put these stones there, and they didn't roll them up on there. No, they knew exactly that the intelligence and, and understanding of how to do that. They knew exactly how to do that. They knew what they were doing. Why? Because they're an advanced civilization. So, no, they weren't. And... She said, well, we don't, know, we don't exactly know what it was for, or they didn't know what they were. We don't know if they knew what they were doing when they built. Of course, well, first of all, yes, Satanists do know what they're doing. They did know by their religion and the spirit that worked in them that as the sun, the winter, you study, if you just see a Wikipedia page of witchcraft, of elemental witchcraft and all those other things, and paganism, and you will see that, yes, they designed everything like that on purpose. And that didn't evolve. They had that knowledge already. What does the Bible say about it? And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. They built those things. It says God made man upright and he sought out many inventions. Many evil inventions man sought out. Listen, these people had advanced knowledge. They understood what they were doing. And that's why we find their technology. Their technology is not out of place. It's right where God buried it in the flood. It just, God just lets it pop up once in a while for us to find, to say, yep, this will throw, this will make the scientists mad. You know what that word mad means? It doesn't mean what you say. Well, I say, I'm mad at you, Brother Finney. That's not what that means. To me, to say that I'm mad, it means they go crazy. That's the 
That's the sign language for crazy, right? Crazy. That's my nickname for Lee, crazy. But that's the sign. Crazy. Okay? But that's, they go crazy. God makes them, God laughs at their derision. He throws that out there, and they're all like, where does this come from? What are we supposed to do with this? Well, I don't know if you just believe the Bible. You'd figure it out real quick, because God said what he did. God said there was a world there. Their, the, their imaginations had taken over. They had gotten crazy. They had gotten wicked. All flesh had corrupted itself before God. And God said, I will destroy man. And he destroyed that world. Nimrod tried to do it again, and God came down. They built the tower. They built a spiritual tower as well. They put it on a certain line for a reason, which we'll talk about some other time. And God confounded their language. And what does the Bible say? They left off building the tower and the city. And they're still building it today. And it's coming. Anyway, so I hope this gives you an understanding of, of some of the things that are out there in this in this world that we have found that, that agree with the Bible. And when it does agree with the Bible, we can accept it. And so far, there has been no science, true observable science, that has been found that disagrees with the Word of God. It agrees with it completely. And you can trust your Bible. God said it. Modern scientists, modern scientists cannot answer these things. They cannot answer how this happened, how, how this happened how this happened, and how this happened. They're like, I don't understand, like, how did they do this? Well, we know how, because they weren't dumb. They were an advanced civilization, and because of their sin, it reached the height, and because they were working with the devil and many other things, giants and all kinds of other things, genetic testing, which we're not going to get into today, but we will sometime, because I'm going to prove to you from their text, they admit it. All this is out there, and it defies evolution, and that's why you don't hear about it. You won't hear scientists talk about it. It's not on NBC News. It's not going to be on Fox News because nobody wants to feel like an idiot except Bible preachers that believe the foolishness of preaching and trust God and know that the wisdom of God, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And God confounds the wise. Amen. Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for all you do for us, Lord. Thank you for giving us all this information. Even, Lord, we have the Bible, and that's enough. We believe it by faith. But we thank you, Lord, that these things are out there and that you defy the haughty scientists and those that shake their fist at you, Lord, and try to bury the truth, but they cannot bury it deep enough that you cannot dig it up and show us, Lord. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the Word of God. Thank you that it's our sole authority of faith and practice, and we understand it. And then you give us things along the way, Lord, to strengthen us and to show us your hand and what took place. And, Lord, we pray you bless the fellowship we have today, bless the food to our bodies. Thank you so much for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Two sides.